Greg received his bachelor's degree locally at UNC Chapel Hill and his master's and his PhD from Vanderbilt. He is currently professor and chair of the Department of English at Winthrop University. He has also taught at Eastern Illinois University, East Carolina University, and he has been a Ford Fellow at the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute at Harvard. In addition to his current project, about which you'll hear tonight, and which will be published by HarperCollins, Greg has worked with Henry Louis Gates on the discovery and publication of, related, the Bond Woman's Narrative by Han uh, Hannah Crafts, which appeared from Grand Central Publishing in 2014. Previous to that, he published reader's guides to Thomas Hardy's Tess of the D'Urbervilles and Jane Austen's Emma. He also published a book about riddles in 19th century British literature. And he has edited an edition of Trollope's Phineas Redux. He has won multiple awards for his energetic and transformative teaching. He's also won grants for his research and has received extensive media coverage and interviews regarding his work on the project that he will present to you tonight. Please welcome Professor Greg Ekimovich, who will speak to you about the true story of Hannah Crafts, America's first black female novelist. Greg? Thank you very much for that kind, very kind introduction. I'm not, I should spend my whole time thanking people, um, but I'm not going to because I want to make sure I get into the, into the um, project for you. But this place is an amazing place and it's such a gift to be here and to work with these other fellow scholars. I've learned so much this year and I'm very, very grateful. The Escape. On a sweltering day in August 1857, a light-skinned woman arrived in the small town of McGrawville, New York. She traced a route along the Tiopanuga Valley where a few slave catchers operated. Her hair was cropped short and she wore men's clothing, dark jacket, vest, and trousers. Lined with dust and sweat, a broad-brimmed hat partially sheltered her face. She called at 19 West Academy Street, the farmhouse on the grounds of New York Central College. A caretaker took her travel case, a gentleman's valise, and ushered her out of the heat. At the back of the house, he disclosed a secret door built into the frame of a wall, disguised amid jagged brick. He removed a stone and revealed the hole. Five narrow steps led to a cool, dim tunnel. Con consisting of dry masonry and lined with heavy stones, the passage stretched hundreds of yards to an opening into, onto Smith Creek, Crouched in semi-darkness, smelling the baked earth above, she waited for the light to part from soil and her next move. After nightfall, the secret door opened and a man's boots appeared. The colored caretaker stepped down to convey food, water, and light. The door closed and the two shared a meal by candlelight. Then he related the bad news. Bounty hunters had picked up her trail. Her enslaver, John Hill Wheeler, was in New York City personally directing the search for her return. The usual passage through Petersburg to Syracuse and up to Canada was deemed unsafe. She'd have to escape, escape into the country alone. Two days later, concealed at Horace, in Horace Craft's attic, she removed the manuscript from the valise. Sweat mixed with ink as she returned her attention to the work. With a dash of her pen, she struck out the name she was disguising, WH-R. She dipped her pen, drew up fresh ink, and risked it all. To the side of the marked out passage, she wrote Wheeler. The ink still fresh on her quill, she back backtracked through the manuscript. Every place where she had marked WH-R, she returned and identified her enslavers. Their names are Wheeler, she wrote, darkening the missing letters over the dash so that there could be no mistake. Mrs. Wheeler informs. Mrs. Wheeler came. Mrs. Wheeler complained. 
Mrs. Wheeler sent for. She refreshed her ink, touched her pen to her wipe, and continued revising the pages of her work. Mr. Wheeler's fault. Mrs. Wheeler, Mr. Wheeler, Mrs. Wheeler. For a slave, the fact that she could read and write was extraordinary. That she escaped with a manuscript in her suitcase is astonishing. Hidden at Horace Craft's farm, using material smuggled to her from New York Central College, she continued work on a narrative that she completed months later in New Jersey. Only after she finished the work did she include a title page, The Bond Woman's Narrative by Hannah Crafts, a fugitive slave recently escaped from North Carolina. This is the closest she came to identifying herself. Like the first male novelist of African descent, William Wells Brown, she adopted the name of a Quaker family that sheltered her. She called herself Crafts. For nearly 150 years, this manuscript remained lost to history. Someone, probably the author, affixed hard covers with glue and cardboard, and then stitched a homemade binding. If the pages were open and read at all beyond the author, no record exists of it. All that is known for certain of the work is that Emily Driscoll, an autograph and book dealer who kept a shop in New York City, acquired the manuscript in 1948 and listed it in her sales catalog as a fictionalized biography written in an effusive style purporting to be the story of the early life and escape of one Hannah Crafts, a mulatto. She noted, from internal evidence, it is apparent that the work is that of a Negro who had a narrative gift, interesting for its content and implications, believed to be unpublished. In 1951, she sold the handbound papers to Dorothy Porter, a librarian and bibliophile, for $85. Driscoll told Porter that she had bought it from a scout in the trade and that all she had gathered of its prior history was that the scout came upon it in Jersey. After initial research, Porter typed a short note that was later appended to the work. It reads, the most important thing about this fictionalized personal narrative is that from internal evidence, it appears to be the work of a Negro and the time of composition was before the Civil War in the late 40s and 50s. There's no doubt that she was a Negro because her approach to other Negroes is that they are people, first of all. Only as the story unfolds in most instances does it become apparent that they are Negroes. Into Porter's file drawer, the manuscript and note went. The work and Porter's notes about it did not come to light again until 2001 when the celebrated scholar and historian Henry Louis Gates Jr. purchased the work at auction and authenticated it and then published it in 2002 to great fanfare. The Bond Woman's narrative sold nearly 200,000 copies and earned for its author a rare literary celebrity. Almost overnight, the mysterious novelist became a publishing sensation. But while Gates confirmed that the author's prob probable master was John Hill Wheeler, he could not locate the mixed race fugitive slave who called herself Hannah Crafts. Who was this extraordinary writer? Why did she tell her story as a novel that mostly hid her identity? And why did her story remain unpublished in her lifetime? Because of the lack of official records, it's not surprising that the life of an author, this author, has gone unmarked. The identity of any given slave during the period when Hannah Crafts lived is obscured by a system that regarded slaves as non-persons, not worthy of distinct record keeping, except as property. And even then, as property, the anonymity of slaves is distinct. Commerce involving human chattel required no gathering and registering of information about the captives as individuals, while the business, in recording, while the business of recording slave lives within discrete families was similarly incomplete. The only standardized documentation, federal census data, limited a slave's official legal existence to age, race, and number, with few other distinguishing identity markers, including names. In September 2013, after more than a decade of archival research and work among private papers, I identified the author. As the New York Times first reported in front page coverage, I discovered the writer through faint traces preserved in diaries, account books, law cases, and probate and census records. By disclosing and piecing together these original source materials, I uncovered not only primary document, documents revealing the life and times of the author, but also historical records giving voice to dozens of slaves intimately connected to the narrative. 
The book I'm writing now is a chronicle of my quest, not only to bring to light the identity of the author, but also to reclaim the events upon which the autobiographical novel is based. The design is deliberately procedural, and I'll try to replicate that here tonight in my presentation. Like a detective story, you can always page forward to discover the identity of Hannah Crafts, but to do so would be to miss the point. Hannah Crafts chose to tell her story as literary fiction, a move that was motivated from more than a need to shelter herself from the psychic trauma of her past. Like her male counterpart, the novelist William Wells Brown, Crafts gathered stories from those she encountered. Then with great skill, she refined these stories in oral tales into a composite text that did justice to the fragmented experience of slave life as she understood it. Similar to Brown, who was a many-handed, all-purpose collector of stories, Crafts reproduced the representative lives of her peers and mixed them into her personal saga. Through the power of imaginative art, and the alchemy of fact and fiction, Hannah Kraft's astonishing novel comes to represent not only the story of her own life, but also the lives and times of those she knew in slavery. To disclose the full story behind the Bond Woman's narrative, I established the case for authorship of the novel by telling the stories of Hannah Kraft's friends and predecessors, the seven Wheeler-related slaves who are potential rivals for production of the work. By unearthing the life stories, their life stories, I build the evidentiary profile necessary to establish the origins of the manuscript and to mark the experiences of the author. As such, this book is not only an investigative encounter into the events behind the novel, but also an original source recording of slavery as told through the eyes of a generation of slaves, channeled and amplified through the de detectable traces of the Bond woman's narrative. The Search. The clues to the writer's identity lie in the manuscript itself. Do thimble marks impressed on correction slips confirm that the writer is female? What can be made of stationer's embossments, crest-like designs in the upper left corner of the stationery sheets that were used to produce the manuscript? Do punctuation irregularities, handwriting style, and literary thefts from white authors point to an autodidact, someone who possessed the courage to steal literacy and learning? Or do these signal the work of a crafty abolitionist, or both? Is the direct mention of Wheeler's slave Jane Johnson a distinguishing clue? What about reference to Clark Mills' equestrian statue of Andrew Jackson installed in Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C. on January 8, 1853? In my study, I weigh a wide range of forensic evidence and historical circumstance and pair these with authorial candidates. Was either Millie or Elizabeth Wheeler the author? I first uncovered their names scribbled in the margins of John Hill Wheeler's almanac in a neglected file at the Library of Congress. These slaves were John Hill Wheeler's chief asset when he married Mary Brown in April 1830. Their presence and locations presented in the novel, Wheeler's Plantation in Eastern North Carolina, the Wheeler's temporary residence in the District of Columbia, even the household of Wheeler relatives in rural Virginia, these invite the case to attribute authorship to one or both. Or perhaps Mary Burton's hand was the one behind the manuscript. I unearthed her presence by locating her deed of sale executed by Wheeler in the Lincoln County Courthouse in Lincolnton, North Carolina. On July 28, 1849, Wheeler sold Burton to former United States Congressman James Graham for $600 when she was 16 because Wheeler's second wife, Ellen, suspected Wheeler of a sexual relationship with the slave. The strident critique of sexual predation that runs throughout the Bond woman's narrative may be Burton's. Other evidence points to a collaboration between Martha Clifton and Ma Margaret Beale. Martha Clifton was a mixed race slave who had been with the Wheeler family since her birth in Murfreesboro, North Carolina, 1826. In 1847, Clifton became involved with other slaves in plotting the escape of 70 slaves on the schooner The Pearl the largest slave escape ever attempted on American soil. Beale and Clifton's stories align with what we know of the Wheeler household and important details disclosed in the manuscript. Perhaps the author was one of two highly literate slaves associated with the Wheeler family, Hannah Moore or Hannah Bond. I discovered Moore and Bond, like Clifton and Beale, in obscure records detailing the property arrangements of the Wheelers and their extended family. 
Moore belonged to John Hill Wheeler's sister, Julia Wheeler Moore, while Bond was enslaved in the household of his brother, Samuel Jordan Wheeler. Both served among an extended network of writers, artists, journalists, and educators centered on the Wheeler family plantation near Murfreesboro, North Carolina. The manuscript bears the mark of their advanced literacy. Many scholars believe the author to be Jane Johnson. On New Year's Day, 1854, John Hill Wheeler purchased Johnson and her two children from Cornelius Crew near Richmond, Virginia. In July 1855, she escaped with her children from a boat docked in Philadelphia Harbor just before the boat set sail as part of a journey that would take Johnson and her children to Nicaragua, where Wheeler was serving as United States minister. At the time, Wheeler was conspiring with the adventurer William Walker to establish a pro-slavery republic on the shores of Central America. Far from the passive figure passed down in the historical accounts of her life, Johnson was an important freedom fighter in the struggle for emancipation. Research confirms her status as a leading candidate. Why does identifying the author matter? And why reclaim the lives of enslaved people connected to the manuscript? The answer is simple. The Bond Woman's narrative is an unprecedented document, yet the voices that shaped its production remain unheard. Hidden within the records that disclose the life and times of Hannah Crafts rests a counter -na narrative, the half that's never been told, as the former slave Lorenzo, Lorenzo Ivey described it in 1937. The forensic sleuthing necessary to uncover Kraft's identity excavates a history of American slavery only now being brought to the surface by scholars like those among this year's fellowship class, including Thomas J. Brown, Anthony Kay, April Maston, and Brenda Stevenson. It's been such a gift to get to work with these people. <clears throat> In her novel, Kraft's reclaimed scores of pi pioneering voices that helped to emancipate a nation, even as these lives went unrecorded and ignored by those seeking to amplify a message of white supremacy. If Kraft's novel invites fresh voices, the work also sets the record straight. To register the life and times of Hannah Crafts is to sound out the personalities and passions of a network of slaves preserved in the art, ink, and thread of the first novel written by an African-American woman. From Nat Turner's rebellion in the Second Middle Passage Southwest to the sexual conflicts faced by female slaves, from the attempted escape of 70 fugitives on the schooner Pearl to the activities of the Underground Railroad and African American community in the North, the search for Hannah Crafts provides a portrait of the lives and times of a generation of enslaved people whose literary record Hannah Crafts marks, uncovers, and vividly brings back to life. At once a detective story, a literary chase, and a cultural history, the true story of the Bond Woman's narrative discovers the Dickensian tale of love, friendship, and betrayal, and inter interracial intrigue against the backdrop of America's slide in the Civil War. As Hannah Crafts herself noted in the Bond Woman's narrative, to those who regard truth as stranger than, fi stranger than fiction, it can be no less interesting. Her words prove prophetic. Now I'm going to read a little bit from chapter one, and then for your pleasure, I'll tell you who Hannah Crafts was, because <laughs> you know, um, people kind of want to know that. The whole trick, to, the, it's, I'm really anxious to get comments about the narrative challenge of trying to tell a micro history and the identity detective story um, with history is, is an incredibly interesting challenge and one that my wife um, hears about constantly. <laughs> Chapter one, Nat Turner, The Wheelers, and the Bond Woman's Narrative. Clustered in pink pedicels, the flowers whitened and then ripened. By midsummer, these simple plants burst into fruit, black purple berries that broke and bled. Enslaved people knew the pokeberry plant well since boiled poke leaves provided an important source of protein not readily supplied by slaveholders. Other parts of the plant were useful too. With powerful hands, Nat Turner crushed the frothy poison from the root and stem and distributed it to his co-conspirators to ward off mosquitoes. Then he, can, then he extracted the blood red juice and gathered it into an impromptu inkwell on the banks of Cabin Pond. In rural Southampton County, Virginia, on a hot summer night in June 1831, Turner charted the deadliest slave rebellion ever conducted on North American soil. 
With pokeberry juice, he stained the course of American history. The map Turner drew marked their intended course. The households that possessed the wives, mothers, children, brothers, and sisters of the conspirators, these would be first. On stolen paper, the rude ink bled. Joseph Travis, Cethelio Francis, John W. Reese, Elizabeth Turner, Richard Porter, Nathaniel Francis, and Peter Edwards. They would attack families from the neighborhood that held slaves and avoid those who did not, a pattern they'd follow to the end. The first four attacks and six of the first nine traced a route through farms and plantations where at least one of the insurgents had been enslaved in the past or remained so that day. The life and times of Hannah Crafts also passed through Turner's hands. From the North Carolina planting communities of Princeton, Murfreesboro, Powellsville, and Indian Woods to rural Lincolnton and Carolyn County, Virginia, Turner's revolt remapped the experience, experiences of an entire generation of black people. This proved especially true for the slave children directly affected by the attacks. Millie, Elizabeth, Martha, the two Hannahs, Mary and Jane. Each potential author of the Bond Woman's narrative harvested the bitterest fruits, fruits of the plot. The childhood of all seven opened like a wound written in the blood of the Virginia pokeweed. And it was a wound that would remain open. Property records demonstrate that the best candidates for authorship all served in neighboring communities. The region in which these seven slaves came of age was haunted by the racial hatred and fear exposed by the revolt. Like Sigmund Freud's Return of the Repressed, Rumors of fresh rebellions circulated every few years in the white communities where the potential authors of the Bond Woman's narrative suffered. In 1832, 33, 38, 42, 46, 49, 50, and others, local militias violently attacked enslaved and freed blacks to reestablish authority over imagined threats. As late as the spring of 1857, just before Hannah Crass fled north, Armed whites again terrorized Murfreesboro, North Carolina, searching for Turner-inspired insurgents. Significantly, the violence occurred a score of weeks prior to the author's arrival at Horace Craft's farm. Caught among the interlocking white families that ruled the Virginia-North Carolina border, the author of the Bond Woman's narrative found her world knitted by the same geography of soil, rivers, and waterways that formed the world of Nat Turner and his insurgents. The tools Turner handled, the local markets he frequented, the customs and kinship networks that formed his shadow community, these the author shared with her older neighbor. Chapter one focuses on Nat Turner to excavate the context of slavery experienced by authorial candidates as a first step to recovering the life and times of Hannah Crafts. As we'll see, Turner's revolt serves not only as a defining moment shaping the real life experiences behind the Bond Woman's narrative, but also an important source of evidence reaffirming, reaffirming the author's identity. To track the course of Nat Turner is to trace the faint trail of America's first black female novelist. One, it was quickly agreed we should commence at home, Nat Turner explained. Starting on Sunday night, August 21st, and continuing all day on Monday, Nat Turner and his men followed a winding route across St. Luke's Parish, stopping at 16 targeted houses. The zigzag course they followed was not the thoughtless and barbaric march towards Jerusalem, remembered and constructed by whites, but rather a targeted blow against a specific institution and its representatives, one sanctioned by Nat Turner's own sense of religious mission. The original conspirators Nat Turner, Hark Moore, Henry Porter, Nelson Edwards, and Sam Francis began at the source, the syndicate of families that owned them. At 3 a.m. in the moonlight, Hark Moore touched the ladder against the second floor window of the Travis home. The sound was meant to be discreet, like the rebellion, and to build from there. No loud firearm reports, only a silent ascent to the bedroom, the seat of power where the fate of slaves and the lives of their families became entangled in the sexual arrangements and property designs of their enslavers. As Turner related later, he held no cause of complaint of Joseph Travis' treatment to me. Travis was a kind master and placed the greatest confidence in me. As for his mistress, Sally Francis Travis, the feeling bordered on friendship. Turner had assumed the role of foreman during her brief widowhood, a period when his mistress even cooked for him. But these fatalities, like others, were divinely sanctioned. Armed with a hatchet and accompanied by will, I entered my master's chamber. It being dark, I could not give a death blow. The hatchet glanced from his head. 
Will laid him dead with a blow of his ax, and Mrs. Travis shared the same fate as she lay in bed. The assailants chose their weapons carefully, especially for these early attacks, favoring Will Francis' broad ax and his strong arm that could dispatch lives quickly and quietly. The same arm and ax strengthened and sharpened by clearing trees from the fields of the Turner family members, these were the tools brought to bear against the institution and people that owned them. The murder of the family, five in number, was the work of a moment. Not one of them awoke, Turner reported. Thomas J. Gray noted the physical evidence at the home a day after the murders. A little infant with its head cut off, he observed, was forced to exchange its cradle for the fireplace. This gruesome theater heralded a truth. Slaveholding was a capital crime that corrupted a blood of gener the blood of generations. There could be no plea of innocence. Two. Outside, in the early morning hours of Monday, August 22nd, Nat Turner clean and loaded weapons recovered from his enslavers. Four guns that would shoot and seven, several old muskets. A full moon hung just above the canopy of trees to the east, one of the reasons the insurgents struck at this hour. Illuminated in the strong light, Turner's movements must have cast shadows onto the Travis home. The house was a one-story frame structure with two rooms left and right and an attic with access through a small window at the gabled end of the main house, 15 feet above the ground. Down the steps and into the master's bedroom, the assailants silently moved. Now the dead bodies of Joseph and Sally stiffened in their feather bed, disturbed only by moonlight. A privacy curtain yawned, the dressing table mirror reflecting back twisted remains. Just above in the garret, Turner's legal owner and a little brother entered rigor mortis, their necks nearly severed from their bodies by the same ax stroke. Their wounds looked freshly open in the light. In the parlor to the right of the master's bedroom, the rebels broke open a standing hutch to get to the family's weapons. The dead eyes of the blacksmith apprentice and one of the Travis children watched as the rebels helped themselves to the firearms, axes, and hatchets in ready supply from the parlor hutch, broadcast against the back wall these movements must have had a kind of manic energy. Other weapons were being collected from Travis's blacksmithing shop. Tools and implements abounded as men moved in and out of the house. In the smithy, the Will Francis sharpened the edge of his broad ax, dulled by contact with bone, muscle, and sinew. As Francis worked the wheel, his grim face sparkled with the light. The report and wine of the grindstone portended the rebels' plans. Shadows danced across corpses. In the bedroom, they flitted over the feather bed with its dead contents, past the bed curtains, the carpet, and a rocking chair. At the dressing table and looking glass, they paused and gathered as a pair of men searched for valuables. In the parlor dining room, the shadows moved again beyond the chairs and the dining table to the privacy screen at the far end of the room. Behind this screen, the rebels ransacked the apprentice's wardrobe before passing out with money, clothes, and the victim's boots. The swiftness of the attacks is suggested by the value of the unbroken china and dinnerware. Six dessert plates, 10 dining plates, a set of china, a salt cellar, two glass pitchers and five glass cans, a sugar dish, and cup plates went undamaged. The family hymn book and Bible, a small parcel of books, a set of silver teaspoons, a second looking glass, picture frames, and even a bottle of castor oil, an umbrella, and a snuff bottle all outlasted the household occupants. I'm just going to pause there. One of the things I'm trying to do, and I'd love to get your opinion, as a, as a reader, as a scholar who reads creative nonfiction, I'll read something like that. I'm like, what? He doesn't know that. He, he can't know that. He's, the, this, is not, this is not sound history. What I'm trying to do is to build in the proof here that later, um, as you'll see. Three. In the early morning heat, a man on horseback charged into the small eastern North Carolina town of Murfreesboro, shouting that the slaves were in rebellion 16 miles away in Southampton County. Thomas Weston, an elderly resident, came out on his porch, heard the news, and dropped dead of fright. To the north, Nat Turner's band of men were butchering slave owners and their families, or so contemporary accounts produced by whites describe the events. Two such victims were the wife and child of John Choctaw Williams, the very man who, maddened by shock, carried the alarm to Murfreesboro. 
Williams, who had earned the name Choctaw because of his olive skin and because he wore his hair long like an Indian, could only keep repeating in a hoarse and unworldly voice that the slaves had killed his wife and cut his child's head off. Shortly, another Southampton slave owner arrived to corroborate Williams' story. Levy Waller's tale was even more gruesome. His nursing infant had been snatched away from its mother and dismembered. Then all 10 of his children and his wife had been hacked to pieces. By this time, a day and a half into the insurrection, Nat Turner's men had claimed the lives of 55 slave owners and their family members, the largest number of white casualties in any single slave revolt in the history of the United States. The rebels followed instructions Turner himself claimed to have received six years earlier from the Holy Spirit, to arise and prepare myself and slay my enemies with their own weapons. For a time, for the time was fast coming when the first should be last and the last first. As panic gripped Murfreesboro and other communities, Turner spurred his men on their way towards Jerusalem, the county seat of Southampton County, Virginia. In Murfreesboro the same day, a well-dressed sober man rode into town at great speed, announcing that the rebels were advancing from Boone's Bridge on the Meharan River a mile and a half away. According to Dr. Thomas Borland, frantic distress was depicted in every face as men and women cried out what they should do. Even as this threat abated, fresh alarms were sounded. Murfreesboro was inundated with families from outlying areas rushing to town seeking security in numbers as the rumors swirled. Whites in more remote areas sought protection at the larger farmhouses or the plantation homes of their neighbors. At a farm a few miles west of Murfreesboro in Northampton's Gumberry section, a witness told of women and children put into the largest room in the house. The door was securely fastened by putting chairs against the lock on the inside. The gun I loaded myself, putting in a double charge of powder and shot so as to kill several at one fire. Besides this, we had an ax in the room. None but the children slept any that night. Hannah Crafts was just a toddler as these events unfolded near her community. She would not have been able to understand the scope of the violence as it began to circle back and tighten its grip on her world. Other African Americans quickly saw the long-term threat offered by the rebellion, not only in the stories of scrambling militias and dismembered whites, but in the surveillance, suspicion, and violence that shadowed their every move. The mask was off and the savage barbarity of America's founding insti institutions stared forth. Four. John Hill Wheeler scribbled notes in his almanac detailing his reaction to the revolt. 22nd, most alarming intelligence reached us at our county court of an insurrection among the Negroes in Southampton at the Cross Keys about 18 miles from the borough. Court, after ordering the militia out, immediately adjourned. At the time of the attack, Wheeler was 24 years old, recently married, and a father busy establishing his legal and political career. Like others, he scrambled back to his family's plantation to secure the safety of his wife and family and the loyalty of his slaves before he reassembled in militia ranks. As shocking as the news proved to be, Wheeler and the other members of Murfreesboro's governor's guards had trained for racial unrest. They understood the power of violence as a measure of justice from their work on slave patrol. Wheeler was one of nearly 100 Hertford County troops, both volunteer and commissioned, dispatched across keys near the scenes of carnage. A home guard of another 150 protected Murfreesboro from possible attack. Retribution killings began almost immediately. In nearby Maney's Neck, farmer Benjamin Britt killed a slave for disobeying a command. At the intersection of the Barrow Road and the Jerusalem Cross Keys Highway, the governor's guard, just taking the field after securing the town, seized nine black prisoners and summarily executed them. The heads of three of the Negroes were stuck up on poles, and for weeks their grinning skulls remained a warning to all who should undertake a similar plot. Today the site is still known as Blackhead Post. On Thursday, August 25th, a free colored man from Ahoski to the east bent his course towards Southampton, attempting to pass through Murfreesboro. The home guard immediately emptied their guns into him. At Mr. Maney's office, there was about eight or ten guns fired at him by the militia. Then they cut his head off and stuck it on a pole and planted the pole at the cross street near old William Ray's store and, and house Forth and Williams. His body was thrown in the bottom not far from where the Broad Street Bridge was. The same afternoon, a lady from the country going in town with her children in her carriage and her driver behaved imprudently so as to almost alarm her to death, and he was cut to death after the lady got to town. 
During their six-day engagement, Murfreesboro Governor's Guards gained a reputation for cruelty. Near Cross Keys, the New England tutor and militia recruit Oliver M. Smith wrote his family a grisly depiction of the violence he witnessed. It has been nothing but kill, kill, murder, murder, he wrote. I never supposed human beings could be capable of such barbarity, much less did I ever expect to be in the midst of and witness to such scenes. Smith reported seeing as many as 12 black prisoners tantalized to de death and trying to make them disclose the plot. Um, nearly 120 people, black and white, have been slaughtered, he wrote. Hannah Kraft's world exploded with violence just as she began to form an understanding of her environment. These events would help determine the mistrust, abuse, sexual violence, and hatred that suffocated her early years in adolescence. Even in her genteel plantation home, even as she played alongside her master's children, she saw the grinning skull behind the master's smile. As Hannah Crafts would discover slowly and with inspired passion, only the bold swing of her pen and the swift motion of her feet could free her from the snare. Like Nat Turner, she too was called to slay her enemies with their own weapons. But it would be some two and a half decades before she was prepared to make her strike and to glimpse and even experience what Nat Turner had prophesied. She, like Nat Turner, would be in the prime of life when her vision took hold and she struck out for freedom. She too would make darkness visible, but this time the weapons would be her quill pen, a sewing box, and paper stolen from her master. Five. This is the part where I try to sneak in the research behind the um, writing, some of the writing. Five, read as evidence, the 1831 inventory of the Travis estate sale provides a compelling report of the crime scene. Even as it paints a physical description of slavery as it was experienced in the region, the auctioneer began in the barn. The cotton grub and weed hose wheeled up by Nat Turner and Hark Moore, these sold first. Plow frames and coulters and other machinery followed. There were more than 60 hogs along with 19 head of cattle, a yoke of oxen, and five horses. Next, the sale moved to the kitchen dependencies separated from the main house to guard against fire. Neighbors purchased varying parcels of dried fruit, meal bags, iron tools, pot racks, frying pans, bowls, milk pots, jars, and other cookware. Then they moved into the house. The bedroom where Joseph and Sally slept included the finest of three feather beds, a carpet, window curtains, a set of bed curtains, a rocking chair, as well as a dressing table and looking glass. Also present was the cradle from which the infant child was plucked and then discarded, tossed into the fireplace among a valuable set of andirons. In the closet below the attic stairway, the family secured their most valuable non-human property, seed cotton, a 48-pound bag and a 20-pound bag, purchased for the next planting season. Here, too, the auctioneer sold four canvas sacks of corn seed and the large trunk that protected the seed from mice. Two carpets and two sets of sitting chairs equipped the parlor dining room, which also serves as the apprentice bedroom. Behind a small screen rests the second best feather bed, where the apprentice slept next to the oldest child of Mrs. Travis. More central to this room stands the dining table and buffet that hold the family's china, tea board, and tea kettle. On the far wall gapes the damaged hutch, now emptied of its firearms. The sparse attic space holds the least of the feather beds on whose occupants Francis practices expert swing. Also present is a walnut table and a cupboard used for storage. In 1831, Southampton County, Virginia, Turner could see no future. 68 pounds of seed cotton and 58 pounds of corn waited to be planted in fields he was tasked to clear. The December 1831 estate sale of the deceased attests to the forced labor coerced from Turner at the time of the revolt. As one of 17 adult slaves directly under Travis's rule, Turner toiled with most of the implements and machines later sold from the barn. The cotton, grub, and weed hose, plow frames, cultures, various coopering instruments used to make barrels. In addition to applying these tools, Turner helped care for nearly 100 livestock, as well, and as one of the most experienced slaves on the plantation, likely he, Turner rendered meat in the sweltering heat of the slaughterhouse. Milk, bacon, ham, eggs, cheese, cotton, wheat, and grain, these were forbidden to him, even as he helped produce such goods for local markets. And the back-breaking work of picking season had just arrived. Judging by December estate sale, the crop turner was responsible to haul that fall was extensive. 
Over $104 worth of cotton and $164 of corn and grain became the property of neighbors after the revolt as the value adjudicated by the executors of Travis's will after the harvest was completed. As probate records demonstrate, Turner's enslavers held assets just sufficient to cover his debts. Executed, executors found a balance in his estate of $51.83, but this was only possible through the liquidation of his slave property, as well as the goods that their labor raised. Turner must have been aware that he and his fellow slaves had been mortgaged to expand operations. At the time of the revolt, the rebel leader found himself in a classic slave paradox. The value of his work only invited further speculation on his person as property. The more Turner worked, the more his enslaver gambled on his capacity to produce still more goods. With each capital outlay, he became more firmly enmeshed in a system that required ceaseless labor. In this way, the success of Turner's labor only increased the likelihood that creditors would someday hold the upper hand. Meanwhile, slave traders plied rural Virginia and North Carolina looking to fill slave cockles bound for the Southwest. Turner would have seen these ch chained men and women trudging south towards the ever-expanding labor camps of the cotton frontier. It was a lesson that Millie, Elizabeth, Martha, the two Hannahs, Mary and Jane would learn soon too. The tide was turning. If slavery looked to be dwindling as a powerful economic institution immediately after the Revolutionary War, the institution became supercharged just as Turner reached his prime working age. Virginia had become a key supplier of forced migrants to the hungry cotton fields of the Southeast. Turner must have known that each seed he planted only raised the bounty on his head while also loosening his hold on wife and child. With all secular paths closed to him, perhaps it's natural Turner turned to biblical models to seek liberty. He would need to swing wildly and widely if he was to carve a new path to freedom. Significantly, the auctioneer recording the Travis estate sold the Francis Travis Bible to the wealthy local planner John Drury, brother-in-law of the deceased Mrs. Travis. Inside resided notes about family slaves as well as, as genealogies for the Turner Francis Moore Travis families. More than half a century later, these details would become the seeds of a pro-slavery account of the revolt written by Drury's grandson, William S. Drury, who inherited the Bible. Based on oral testimony conducted with family members identified in the Bible, the Southampton Insurrection 1900 recast events for a racist white public nearly 80 years after the revolt. For Drury, brandy-soaked rebels ran wild while victimized whites enjoyed the protection of loyal slaves. The sins of the father would be practiced again and again in the retelling of Matt Turner's story for nearly the balance of the century, aided and abetted by the Wheeler family. We're going to see their historians, and they, they are very important in establishing this, this memory for Nat Turner. It would take until the new millennium before the buried stories of authors like Hannah Crafts emerged to even the scales. Last, six. In the opening pages of her novel, written 25 years later, the author who adopted the pseudonym, Hannah Crafts, omits direct representation of violence surrounding Turner's rising. Instead, Crafts relates a story passed down about an old house slave named Rose and her beloved dog, the favorite of a daughter who had been sold into slavery in Alabama. When her cruel master orders Rose to kill the dog, she refuses, and as punishment, woman and dog are suspended horrifically from a linden tree. Crafts frames the story as one that, quote, we had heard told in the dim duskiness of the summer twilight or by the roaring fires of wintry night. Now take this old witch and her whelp and give it them alive on the linden, Sir Clifford de Vincent said, his features distorted and his whole frame seeming to dilate with intensity and passion. An iron hoop being fastened around the body of Rose, she was drawn to the tree and with great labor elevated and secured to one of the largest limbs. And then with a the refinement of cruelty, the innocent and helpless little animal with a broad iron belt around its delicate body was suspended within her sight, but beyond her reach. And thus suspended between heaven and earth in a posture the most unimaginably painful, both hung through the long, long days and the longer nights. Not a particle of food, not a drop of water was allowed to either, but the master walking each morning would fix his cold, cruel eyes with appalling indifference on her agonized countenance and call to inquire whether or not she was ready to be the minister of his vengeance on the dog. 
For three consecutive days, she retained the strength to answer that she was not. Early critics searching the text for authentic detail found Rose's death unconvincing. If this was truly an autobiographical novel, they asked, why all the creaking Gothic machinery? A ghostly power loosens the portrait of her master from its fastings in the wall. The decayed branches of the linden tree clatter at the master's window. Whence is that frightful noise? The spectral presence of a murdered slave haunts Kraft's text. But what else could an enslaved person write growing up in the shadow of Nat Turner? There's a reason the earliest African-American writers, including Harriet Jacobs and Harriet Wilson, identified with and wrote in the vernacular of the Gothic. As victims of caprice, these authors could not look to justice to save them. Rather, with its panoply of forced separations, haunted enclosures, instruments of torture, and gruesome violence, the associative logic of the Gothic fit the emotional and situ situational truths of their lives. Forced separation, torture, rape, death, extremes of psychic and physical violence. This was the everyday stuff of their existence. In the Gothic, these authors found the terms of a life they recognized and one as writers they could imaginably control and make meaningful by appropriating its terms. These principles are likely what propelled rebels as diverse as Nat Turner and Hannah Crafts to command the same materials. As Nat Turner himself avowed, he adopted his revolt and for his revolt, a mold, mode of indiscriminate slaughter to ensure he would strike terror and alarm into the hearts of the white community. The reports from the scenes of the revolt, as related in the press, demonstrate the sensibility of Turner's work. Disfigured remains of wives and children, se several children whose brains were knocked out, and later bodies chopped to pieces and tortured to death. Like the crazed prophet of the apocalypse that whites reported him to be, his work left a macabre trail befitting the most extreme Gothic novelist. Virginia Governor John Floyd summarized, our fellow citizens had fallen victim to the relentless fury of assassins and murderers, even whilst wrapped in profoundest sleep. And these deeds have been perpetrated in a spirit of cruelty unknown to savage warfare, even in their most revolting form. Crafts too designed her revenge, designed her graphic revenge, putting her hand, as Turner did, in the hand of the Almighty. In her preface, she asked, have I succeeded in portraying any of the peculiar features of that institution whose curse rests over the fairest land the sun shines upon? And she answers, pious and discerning minds can scarcely fail to recognize the hand of providence in giving to the righteous the reward of their works and to the wicked the fruit of their doings. Crafts divine justice with her pen, just as Turner hewed it with an ax. Okay, so who was Hannah Crafts? It's, I'll just give you the facts here. Hannah Crafts. Hannah Crafts was Hannah Bond, born on the plantation of Lewis. And, you can't tell anybody. After, um, just kidding. Hannah Crafts was Hannah Bond, born on the plantation of Lewis and Catherine Pugh Bond in Bertie County, North Carolina in 1826. Light skinned and highly prized Hannah Bond, like the near white Hannah Crafts, was brought up to be a house slave. Crafts' stealthy means of learning to read testified to Bond's theft, not only of the art of literacy, but of the very tools of writing, likely purloined from her master. At the age of 24, Hannah Bond was conveyed to Esther Bond, a daughter of Lewis and Catherine's, and in 1853 became the maidservant of the deceased Esther's sister, Lucinda Bond Wheeler, wife of Samuel Jordan Wheeler of Murfreesboro, North Carolina. Hannah Bond and the other Wheeler slaves in the Wheeler family household in eastern North Carolina enjoyed a unique access to literary texts, in part because they served among numerous student boarders who lived with the Wheelers while attending Chowan Female Baptist Institute and Wesleyan Female Institute, two prominent female colleges located in Murfreesboro. One of the text students commonly studied in this community was Charles Dickens' Bleak House. This may account for Hannah Kraft's surprising familiarity with and reliance on Bleak House in developing her autobiographical novel. In the summer of 1856, because of debts that Samuel owed his brother, John Hill Wheeler, Hannah became the personal slave of John's wife, Ellen Sully Wheeler, identified as Mrs. Wheeler in the Bond Woman's narrative, the vain and shallow mistress targeted for satirical attack in the novel. Like Crafts, Bond lived with the Wheelers in Washington, D.C. in 1856 and early 1857, while her master, a former U.S. minister, hunted for a government appointment. 
In the spring of 1857, Hannah Bond escaped from the Wheeler family plantation outside Murfreesboro, North Carolina, disguised as a man and more than likely hiding a manuscript that she had already begun, Bond, like crafts, made her way north. Near McGrawville, New York, Horace Kraft, a local farmer, hid the fugitive from her pursuing master. In honor and gratitude to her better, Hannah Bond chose Crafts as her pen name. Bond escaped to an all-black community to the east of New York State, settling in Lawnside, New Jersey, a community of free, with a community of freed and escaped slaves. There, Hannah Bond Crafts, like the protagonist in her novel, married and became a school teacher, eventually finishing her novel in 1858. The title is a clever trick. The Bond Woman's narrative by Hannah Crafts, a fugitive slave recently escaped from North Carolina. Hannah Bond announces and disguises her identity here. She began with the name Crafts. Bond ad adopted the name Crafts with the S to honor both Alan Craft, a celebrated fugitive slave who pioneered cross-dressing as a route to freedom, and to honor Horace Craft and his family, who risked punishment by shielding her on their modest 20-acre farm. She is indeed a Bond woman, and her narrative owns a, owes a debt of, to the assistance she received from Horace Craft. By writing her relationship to the Wheelers directly into her novel, and by slyly signaling her journey to independence, Hannah Bond Crafts realizes and declares her liberty, defying at once the will of her pursuers and the laws of a country that defined her as property. Her escape and identity have remained a mystery ever since. Thank you.